Good afternoon. Welcome to Grade 12 English First Additional Language. Today's lesson is going to be about revision of Macbeth Act 1. I would recommend that you sit with your book and your notes that you can highlight and add notes while I'm explaining. It's a beautiful day to learn something new. So here we go. Act 1, Scene 1. The summary of this scene. The three witches are introduced. They are the embodiment of evil and are referred to as the Weird Sisters. They inform us that they are going to meet with Macbeth. Themes that we see in this scene. First of all, the supernatural. Now, the supernatural themes, that is things or events beyond what is natural or explainable. In this scene, the witches make their first appearance. They are seen to be chanting and foreshadowing future events. The reversal of values. This is the distorted world of the witches, where nothing is as it seems. If we look at the character descriptions, the witches are they actual supernatural beings? Remember, in those days, it's very important that you take note, people believed that witches were real. So why do they want to meet with Macbeth? They knew he has a tendency towards evil. He can be influenced. And then important lines in this scene, fair is foul and foul is fair. The reversal of values, the theme is evident here. Evil is seen as desirable, while good things are rejected. If we look at the extract on your screen, and this is where the three witches are discussing where they're going to meet Macbeth. And they start with, when shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning or in rain? Very important, the witches only meet when the weather and the nature is turbulent and the atmosphere is unpleasant. The second witch, when the hurly-burly is done, when the battle is lost and won. The words hurly-burly refer to the uproar and confusion of the battle. And when the battle is lost and won, when the battle is over, in other words, lost by one party and won by the other, the witches can predict the future. They know the outcome of the battle. And that will be near the set of sun before sunset, where the place upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. So the witches' interest in Macbeth is ominous. Ominous meaning something bad is going to happen. So this is a suggestion that they wish to influence him in some way. And then they end at the end of this extract with fair is foul and foul is fair. So good things are evil and evil things are good. Remember the witch's values are opposite to those of other people. They love what others hate. They love what is evil and ugly instead of what is good and beautiful. And then the last line, hover through the fog and filthy air. They hang or float because they can fly. Fog and filthy air, the witches are part of a murky, suffocating and sinister world of confusion, evil, deception, corruption and darkness. Act 1, Scene 2. The Summary. Duncan is introduced in this scene. A soldier comes to Duncan to tell him that Macbeth has killed the rebel MacDonald. However, the battle continues as the Norwegian lord began a new assault. He was aided by the Thane of Cordor. Macbeth was able to defeat them. Duncan orders the Thane of Cordor to be killed and give Macbeth the title. Just some notes, the Thane is a title of nobility in Scotland and Bologna's bridegroom that, are mentioned, that is mentioned in this scene. Bologna was a goddess of war and Macbeth was described as her bridegroom because of his bravery on the battlefield. If we look at some of the characters that we encounter in this scene, Duncan, first of all, he seems to be in control. Macbeth. Even though we don't meet him, we learn about him. 
We learn that he's a brave soldier, loyal to his country, and his nobility is contrasted to MacDonald's and the Thane of Cordor's treachery. We learn, uh, we get to know MacDonald. He's a traitor and a leader of the Scottish rebels, and then the King of Norway, who is called Sweno. Now, important lines in this scene as two spent swimmers that do cling together. And then Duncan's words, O oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. And then again, the soldier's words, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. If we look at the specific extract, this is where Duncan is asking about the sergeant that is approaching to report back. And then the sergeant, his words, doubtful it stood as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. Now, doubtful it stood, it was not clear which side would win. And then a very important simile that they love to ask as two spent swimmers that do cling together and choke their art. So the simile here is Macbeth and MacDonald are compared to two exhausted, spent swimmers who hold on to each other tightly, preventing each other from swimming, which means the two armies were evenly matched in battle. It was not clear which side would win. And then this is where the sergeant are continuing to report back on what happened in the battle. And this is where Macbeth killed MacDonald, where he said he carved out his passage till he faced the slave. Now he used his sword, that is Macbeth used his sword to cut his way through the enemy to get to the leader MacDonald, calls him the slave as a term of insult and then how did he die which never shook hands nor bade farewell to him he did not bother to take the polite farewell by shaking hands till he unseamed him from the nave to the chops he cut his body open from his navel to his jaw or his cheeks and then and fixed his head upon our battlements he beheaded him too so as a warning to others the heads of defeated rebels or traitors were placed on spears and displayed on the castle walls. This can foreshadow Macduff's beheading of Macbeth at the end of the play. And then the very important words of Duncan, O oh, valiant cousin, worthy gentleman. Now we know Duncan and Macbeth are cousins. And Duncan thinks Macbeth is brave and heroic. Right. Question in a previous paper about specifically that, that line. The first question was identify the tone in this line. Remember, tone can be heard in someone's voice because of the way in which the person speaks. So tone is all about what you hear. So in this case, can be a tone of praise, admiration, approval, pride or gratitude. Then very important, explain the irony in these words in relation to what happens later in the play. Very important that last part, in relation to what happens later in the play. Let's take this question apart. Let's analyze the question. First of all, what is irony? It means a situation that ends up in quite a different way than what is generally anticipated. These words, valiant, means courageous, worthy, means entitled to respect. And then what happens later in the play? Macbeth kills Duncan. Remember, when you see the word irony, your answer must contain the word but. So your answer will be Duncan refers to Macbeth as courageous and worthy, but later in the play, Macbeth will be the ultimate traitor by killing Duncan. So now the soldier here is still reporting on um, the battle. So just before this slide, Duncan asked the sergeant if the new attack did not frighten or discourage Macbeth or Banquo. And this was his answer. And here are two very important similes. 
The first one he answers, he says, yes. The question was, remember, were they not afraid? Were they not frightened or discouraged by this new attack? And he said, yes, as sparrows, eagles, or the hare, the lion. So he's actually being ironic. He says, Macbeth and Banquo were as troubled or as afraid by the attack as an eagle, a very big, strong bird, would be if it was attacked by a sparrow, a very small bird, or if a lion were attacked by a hare. So in other words, they were not worried or threatened at all. And then he goes on, he says, to tell the truth, I must report, they were as cannons overcharged with double cracks, so they doubly redoubled strokes upon the foe. So Macbeth and Banquo were like cannons that are filled with twice the usual amount of explosive. So they fought with double the energy against the enemy. Act 1, Scene 3. The witches appear again. They give three predictions to Macbeth and one to Banquo. Remember, the witches greeted Macbeth as Thane of Glamis, his present title, which he inherited from his father. They greeted him as Thane of Cawdor, the title King Duncan gave him out of gratitude for his loyalty. And they greeted him as future king, something he secretly desires. Okay. And then they made one prediction to Banquo. And they said, seemingly not as important, but more important than Macbeth, appears not to be as happy, but he is happier than Macbeth. And although he won't be king himself, his children will be kings. Scarcely have the predictions been made, then Ross and Angus arrive to tell Macbeth that he has been made Thane of Cawdor. Macbeth and Banquo react differently. Banquo recognizes evil as such, but Macbeth is now encouraged to put further trust in them, that is the witches. Macbeth now hopes the prediction that he will become king will also come true. He even considers murder to make it happen. Banquo warns Macbeth against the witches. He recognizes the witches' evil. He knows they manipulate people by seemingly dealing in truths. However, that is a trick to win their trust so that they can lead people to damnation. If we look at the character descriptions, Macbeth, we can see his ambition begins to work at him. And Banquo, loyal to the king and not influenced by the predictions. Important lines where Macbeth said, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. So this is the extract where Macbeth starts with, So foul and fair a day I have not seen. So Macbeth's first words ironically recalls the witch's fair is foul and foul is fair. He means that it has been a good and a bad day. It's been a good day because of the victory and a bad day because of the stormy weather and the hard battle. This is a subtle indication that Macbeth is already connected to the evil of the witches. He appears to be in the right frame of mind to accept what they might suggest. The witches must only spark his imagination. Right, and this is where they now saw the witches and Macbeth urges the witches to speak. He demands to know what they are and they immediately react as they came to speak to him. They know he is susceptible to their evil suggestions and they say, All hail Macbeth, hail to the Thane of Glamis. So that's his present title that he inherited from his father, Sinel. And then the second one, all hail Macbeth, hail to the Thane of Cawdor. He has already been given this title, but is still unaware of it. And in the third witch, all hail Macbeth, that shall be king hereafter. She salutes him as the future king of 
Scotland. And this is the scene or the extract in where they um, give the prediction to Banquo, lesser than Macbeth and greater. So he's not as currently politically great as Macbeth, yet he will be even greater than him in the future through his descendants. Not so happy, yet much happier. He does not seem to be as fortunate as Macbeth, but more blessed, and thus will be much happier than Macbeth. And thou shalt get kings, though thou be none. So he will be the father of future Scottish, Scottish kings, although he himself will not be king. And then they end with, so all hail Macbeth and Banquo. Banquo and Macbeth all Hail. So notice how the witches reverse the order of their names. Initially they say, all hail Macbeth and Banquo. So Macbeth will be greater. But in the fullness of time, now they say Banquo and Macbeth all hail. Ba it is Banquo who will become more important. Right. Please take note at the difference between Macbeth and Banquo under the influence of the witches. Macbeth is deeply disturbed while Banquo takes it in his stride. Right, and this is where Banquo is um, addressing the witches. And then my noble partner explain how the words my noble partner become ironic later in the play. Again, we analyze the question noble meaning of high moral principles or fine personal qualities. Partner is my friend. Irony means a situation that ends up in quite a different way than what it is generally anticipated. And then later in the play, Macbeth hire murderers to kill Banquo. So remember when you see the word irony, your answer must contain the word but. So our answer will be Banquo sees Macbeth as his friend with high moral principles whom he trusts, but Macbeth will be the one who has him killed later in the play. A theme that is evidence in this scene, appearance versus reality. First of all, what does appearance versus reality mean? Something appears in a certain way, but in reality it is totally different. So what you see is not necessarily the truth. In this extract, when the witches delivers their prediction to Macbeth, he sees only the possibility of being king and loses sight of the true nature of the witches. So what does it mean? The appearance, the witches seem to bring good tidings. It's good news that they give Macbeth. But in reality, they are evil. They have a plan with what they are doing. And another example of appearance versus reality is about the witch's physical appearance. It is misleading. They have beards. They look like men, but, but they are women. So in reality, they are women. And then Banquo describing the witches where he says, By each at once her choppy finger laying upon her skin, skinny lips, why do the witches perform this action? It's to indicate that they do not want Banquo to speak or ask any questions. Remember, they didn't come there to speak to Banquo. They came there to speak to Macbeth. So they wanted him to be quiet. Banquo had to be quiet. The moment Macbeth addressed them, they reacted. Explain the real reason why the witches address Macbeth as the Thane of Cawdor. They know Macbeth will be given the title after the Thane of Cawdor is executed for treason. They can see in the future. And this is part of the witches' plan to trick Macbeth into believing whatever they tell him to gain his confidence. So that if, the, he, be if he believes them about becoming the Thane of Cawdor, they know he will believe them about becoming king.
What does this extract reveal about Banquo's character? Now, here you have to always look at the mark allocation of a question like this. If it's only for one mark, you only need to write down a character trait. If it's for two marks, you need to write down a character trait and a motivation. And remember, a character trait is not an action. So in this case, it was for two marks. And you had to tell me Banquo is brave because so the because part is your second mark he's the first to confront the witches when he told them how can you just um give macbeth these wonderful predictions but you tell me nothing and then banquo is confident because he tells the witches he's not afraid of their predictions and then banquo is curious because he wants to know about his future Banquo is observant because he notices a change in Macbeth's behavior immediately after the predictions. And then the next question, how do Macbeth's and Banquo's reactions differ after their encounter with the witches? Very important question. Banquo is distrustful. He sees the witches for the evil that they are of the witches, but Macbeth believes in the witches. He immediately starts to trust them. Act 1, Scene 4. Now, in the summary, Malcolm is describing the execution of the Thane of Cawdor. Macbeth and Banquo enter and are thanked by Duncan for their loyalty and service. Duncan now promises to reward them with more honours. Duncan then names his son Malcolm as heir to the throne, which is Prince of Cumberland, as an honour to Macbeth. Duncan invites himself and the court to Macbeth's castle. Macbeth leaves immediately but is upset that Malcolm has been named heir and immediately considers murder again. Now, the proclamation here of the heir to the throne must have come as a tremendous shock to Macbeth. Um, everything that has happened, the way that Duncan thanked and praised him, and the witch's predictions, of which the first already came true, made him believe that he would succeed Duncan. Remember, the, the Scottish throne was not automatically passed from father to son. The strongest family member would become king at the king's death, unless the king named a successor, which he just did. If we look at the character descriptions, Macbeth, we can see his ambition grows because he's upset that he's not heir to the throne. Duncan is not a good judge of character. He trusted the previous Thane of Cawdor who was a traitor and now he's going to trust Macbeth as well. And then important lines where Duncan says there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face. Right, and this is the, the extract where he says that. In the beginning here is Malcolm describing the way that uh, the Thane of Cawdor, the previous Thane of Cawdor was executed. And then Duncan answers, he says, there's no art to find the mind's construction in the face so he says there's no way that we can know what somebody thinks by looking at the expression on his face so he admits he has fully trusted the thane of cordor we can see that duncan's goodness and trusty nature leads to his inability to see or suspect betrayal in others and then he continues where he says he was a gentleman on whom i built an absolute trust and at that moment macbeth enters so it's dramatic irony because when macbeth enters and he hears duncan's word words about the treacherous thane of cordor we know that duncan will be equally mistaken in the trust he places in macbeth macbeth will deceive him too, but this time it will cost Duncan his life. Act 1, Scene 5. The summary, Lady Macbeth is reading a letter. 
her husband has sent telling her about the prophecies and their partial fulfillment. She expresses her determination that the third prophecy will also come true. However, she also believes that Macbeth is not capable of the direct action required, that is the murder of Duncan, and decides she must spur him on. A messenger arrives with the news that Duncan is on his way to Inverness. She knows this will be an ideal opportunity to carry out her plan and wants her femininity to be replaced with evil. At the end, Macbeth arrives. Character descriptions we can see in this scene, Lady Macbeth is cruel and she takes control. Important lines that we're going to look at is when Lady Macbeth says both these lines, unsex me here, and yet I do fear thy nature. Right, this is where Lady Macbeth says the lines um, after reading Macbeth's letter. She speaks her thoughts about it in a soliloquy in which she reveals a great deal about both Macbeth's and her own character. According to her, Macbeth is already the Thane of Glam's and Cawdor, and he shall become king as has been predicted by the witches. And this is where she says, Yet do I fear thy nature is too full of the milk of human kindness. So now she says, He is too kind um, and humane to resort to murder in order to become king. He's too kind and compassionate and lacks the necessary cruelty. Right, she says, you're not without ambition, but you lack the true evil that is needed to perform this deed. Right, and then this is the part where Lady Macbeth calls on the evil spirits, where she says, Come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty, make thick my blood, stop the access and passage to remorse that no compunctious visitings of nature shake my fell of purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it come to my woman's breast and take my milk for gall, you murdering minister. So she's calling on the evil spirits to destroy or take away her feminine qualities, to lose any qualities like tenderness, compassion, pity that are normally associated with womanhood. She says, and fill me from the crown to the toe top, fulfill her from head to toe completely with the most terrible cruelty. Make thick my blood. She f wishes for her blood to thicken so that pity can't flow through the veins to her heart. And then um, she asks, she does not want her conscience to stop her horrible plans so she's actually saying let no tender feelings gain interest to entrance to her heart so that her horrible intentions are not shaken by her conscience and thus prevent her from committing the horrible deed right now here lady macbeth is talking to macbeth informing him about her plan to kill Duncan and instructing him not to reveal his feelings of doubt and fear with his facial expression. So this is where she says, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. So the theme of appearance versus reality, very clear here, which she says he must deceive people by looking innocent and hospitable while in reality he is planning to murder his host. Look at the contrast between the innocent flower and the venomous snake, the serpent. And the serpent is a reminder of the ever-present evil and also an allusion to the Garden of Eden, the snake that we found in there. And then she says, He that is coming must be provided for. 
So now that is superb irony with adorable double meaning. So he says, he that is coming for, that is Duncan, must be provided for. So preparations must be made for the king's visit. It's a great honor to host the king. But it also means that the preparations must be made for Duncan's murder. And then she says, and you shall put this night's great business into my dispatch. So she's using a euphemism when talking about the murder. She's saying great business. She never mentions the word murder. And to put it into my dispatch, leave everything in my control. So she assumes responsibility for what must be done. So this conversation is a good example of the current differences in approach of Macbeth and Lady Macbeth to the murder. She's cool, calculated and completely callous while Macbeth is agitated and conscience stricken. They met me in the day of success. So that is the letter that she's reading. And then the question asks, why does Macbeth refer to that particular day as the day of success? Obviously, it was the day that Macbeth had his victory on the battlefield against the rebels and the Norwegians. Again, when you answer the question, give all the details necessary. Do not only answer because he had a victory. It's not enough information. And then the words in the letter, my dearest partner of greatness, explain uh, the meaning or why did he use these words. These words prove that Macbeth not only loves his wife, but that they share ambition for power and greatness. That last part, very important. They shared ambition for power and greatness. Then what does this extract tell us about the witches? Right? Remember, if you see a question in Macbeth, take note of the words, this extract, or the play as a whole. Very, very important. If it's this extract, you cannot go beyond that or previous parts of the, the drama. You can only focus on the extract in front of you. Um, so what does it tell us, tell us about the witches? Uh, they know more than normal people do in the letter it says they have more in them than mortal knowledge they can make themselves invisible they made themselves air they can tell the future and they are called the weird sisters please as far as possible always answer in your own words right now this is the last prophecy of the witches hail king that shall be would Lady Macbeth have been surprised reading about this prophecy? So would she have um, expected it or not? So if you say, make very sure that you answer, if you say yes, that you give your motivation correctly, because sometimes you mix the two up and we can't get a yes answer with a no motivation, then we mark it incorrectly. So would Lady Macbeth have been surprised reading about yes, she would have been surprised because she's not thought about Macbeth becoming king. Macbeth has not done anything to accomplish his ambitions or Macbeth is not the next heir to the throne. Or no, she wouldn't have been surprised. In other words, she would have been expecting it. Because Macbeth is related to Duncan, there is an expectancy that he might become the next king. He is the sign of Cordor that the witches predicted. Therefore, it's likely for the other prophecy to come true. Then how did this Hail King shall be become a self-fulfilling prophecy later in the play? Remember, self-fulfilling means something comes true as a result of your own actions. Now the answer, King Duncan arrives to stay at Macbeth's castle. Give me all the information surrounding this. Lady Macbeth uses this opportunity to convince Macbeth to kill Duncan. After the death of Duncan, Macbeth is declared king after Duncan's sons run away. You see the extent of information that is given here. If you only answer that Macbeth killed Duncan, you can only expect one mark because it's not enough information. You have to paint the whole picture surrounding that question. How did it come about 
that Macbeth became king. In other words, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It start with Duncan coming to visit at the castle, Lady Macbeth convincing Macbeth to kill Duncan, Macbeth killing Duncan, Mac, uh, the um, sons run away and uh, uh, Macbeth is declared king. Then what do we know about Lady Macbeth's character at this point in the play? So from the beginning up until now, she's bold and ambitious. Right, remember I told you, if your character um, question is for two marks, you need a character trait and a motivation. This was only for one mark, so you only needed to give the character trait. She is decisive, she's wicked or evil, she's commanding and controlling. She, you could have mentioned any one of those and you would get your mark. What does Lady Macbeth mean when she says that Macbeth's character is too full of the milk of human kindness? This is from the soliloquy that she um, gave when she discussed um, Macbeth's character and what she's going to do about it. Too full of the milk of human kindness, Lady Macbeth believes Macbeth's nature is too kind or gentle or humane to commit murder or to kill Duncan. And then which theme is linked to both Macbeth and Lady Macbeth in this extract? It is obviously ambition. Act 1, Scene 6, Duncan is met by Lady Macbeth instead of Macbeth, which is highly irregular. Macbeth cannot face Duncan, he's not in control of his emotions yet, and he cannot control his facial expression. Remember it was, the host was supposed to be the man to come out to greet the important guest, and the king was the most important guest that could come and visit you at your castle. That's why it's highly irregular for Lady Macbeth to come out and greet the king. Right, very important theme in this scene is appearance versus reality. Lady Macbeth appears to be loyal, but is equivocating as she plans the murder of Duncan. Very important irony, the chief irony of this scene is the way Duncan and Banquo see the castle as a place of peace, while inside Macbeth is preparing for the murder. If we look at the characters, Duncan, his trusty nature makes him vulnerable to the traitors, uh, the treacherous Lady Macbeth meets Duncan, pretending to be a loyal subject, but we know she is equivocating. Right, the most important things you need to remember about Act 1, Scene 6 is the chief irony. Both Duncan and Banquo see the castle as a place of peace and heavenly harmony, while inside Macbeth is preparing for murder to realize their shell selfish earthly ambitions. And then uh, the fact that Lady Macbeth came out to greet Duncan. Macbeth supposedly went ahead of Duncan to prepare for his visit. However, he does not go out to meet the king. When he arrives at the castle, this is very irregular. As host, Macbeth should have gone before her to welcome his guests. Duncan believed that this was the reason why he rode ahead, to be there to prepare for the visit and to be able to welcome them. Perhaps he is afraid to face Duncan after what Lady Macbeth has suggested. He does not yet have full control over his facial expression. So we see that Lady Macbeth goes out to meet Duncan. However, the audience knows that her welcome is insincere. She has the ability to play the part of the perfect hostess while she knows they are plotting Duncan's murder. This is the most important that you have to remember from Act 1, Scene 6. Act 1, Scene 7. Macbeth is talking to himself again. <laughs> he hems and haws about over the consequences he'll face if he decides to commit murder. He knows that killing Duncan could mean bad news for him and just about everyone else in Scotland. When Lady Macbeth enters, he tells her he can't go through with this sordid plan. But she's got other ideas. 
trying to psych her husband up for some regicide, she tells him he's not much of a man if he can't find the courage to kill the king. Then she hatches a plan. They will wait until Duncan is asleep, get his servants drunk, kill the king in his bed and blame it on the servants. Sounds good to Macbeth and he commits to the plan. Right, very important. When Macbeth was standing alone, talking to himself, a soliloquy, um, he gave the reasons why he should not kill Duncan. Duncan is his family member and trusts him fully. He is Duncan's host and he should protect him, not kill him. Duncan is his king and he has been a wonderfully fair king. If we look at the characters, Macbeth, he realized that the murder of Duncan will lead to his damnation and it would all, will also unleash a cycle of violence in which he will be caught up. Macbeth is persuaded by his wife to go ahead with the murder. He now embraces a world of appearance rather than reality and become an evil equivocator. Lady Macbeth attacks her husband violently and calls him a coward and not a man of his word. Always remember, Lady Macbeth may influence her husband, but she cannot force him to kill Duncan. The choice remains his. Right, this is just where Duncan, uh, Macbeth is giving the reasons why he should not kill Duncan. He says, He's here in double trust. First, as I am his kinsman and his subject. I'm his cousin and his king. He's my cousin and my king. He trusts me. Strong both against the deed, then his host, who should against the murder, shut the door, not bear the knife himself. So Macbeth is Duncan's host. He is honor bound to protect him. And then beside this, Duncan hath borne his faculty so meet, had been so clear in his great office. He's been a very good king and a gentle, humble, innocent man. Right, and then Lady Macbeth enters and she convinces Macbeth that they should go ahead um, with killing him and Macbeth is convinced because Lady Macbeth attacks him violently and she calls him a coward and not a man of his word because he promised to kill Duncan and then she presents a murder plan that uh, will remove the consequences. She will drug Duncan's guards so that they will fall asleep and not be able to guard Duncan at all. Uh, they will then murder the sleeping Duncan and they will frame the guards for the murder. We all know Macbeth is now highly excited and he refines the plan. They should use the guards' daggers instead of his own and then they should smear the guards with Duncan's blood to seal their guilt. So this is where Macbeth says, I am settled and bend up. He is finally convinced. He goes through with the murder and he says, Away and mock the time with fairest show. False face must hide what the false heart doth know. So now he is the one who urges Lady Macbeth that should go back to the banquet hall, deceive everyone present with the appearance of friendliness. Uh, previously, his wife encouraged him to put up false appearances. We can see Macbeth has committed himself to a life of deception. Once a man of honesty, he now has to be a liar. He has to put on an outward show to conceal his foul thoughts of murder. Right, this is just an example of a question paper from the past. This extract is Act 1, Scene 3. Uh, so, foul and fair a day I've not seen. Macbeth had said that. And then it's the witches' predictions. All hail Macbeth, hail to the Thane of Glams. And they end it with the prediction to Banquo. And then just typical questions. The first one was, you were given words that you had to fill in. If we have a look at that, at the end of this scene, Macbeth is warned again against what the witches trusting the witches, Banquo believes that the evil forces tell them the truth about trivial matters, not important matters, in order to win their trust. The witches then lie to them about important things. This warning shows that Banquo recognizes the witches for what they are, while Macbeth doesn't. Then refer to line one, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. Very important, they will ask this 
if this extract is ever asked in a test or an exam, uh, exam, explain in your own words why Macbeth describes the day as being both foul and fair. Please be sure you have to show a clear difference between the two. You have to write down foul uh, because of the bad weather, fair because of the victories. All right, so foul, it can be the weather or all the deaths on the battlefield and fair would be the victory. Just be sure to show a clear difference between the two. Why is it significant that Macbeth echoes the witch's words foul and fair? Because it creates a link between Macbeth and these evil characters. Um, this shows that they, the, the, the witches have already uh, um, have a connection with Macbeth. Refer to lines 12 to 14, all hail Macbeth, hail up until King Year after. The witches address Macbeth by three titles. Which one of the three titles does Macbeth currently hold? That's obviously Thane of Glams. Which of the three titles does Macbeth receive during this scene? Thane of Cawdor. And explain in your own words, how it came about that Macbeth received the title. Remember here, I want the full story. You have to tell me what happened to the previous um, Thane of Cawdor and then how did it come about that Macbeth got it. So you had to say the previous Thane of Cawdor was a traitor who fought with the Norwegians and the rebel forces and Duncan ordered that he must be executed. And then King Duncan gave the title to Macbeth as a sign of his gratitude and generosity. And then explain in your own words what the witch's predictions for Banquo's future replies for Macbeth. So the witches predict that Banquo's children will be kings and that implies that Macbeth's children will not be king and Macbeth will not be king forever. 1.5 or 5.1 do you think the witches are mostly to blame for awakening Macbeth's ambition to become king? Motivate your answer. Remember, you can say yes or no, you can give a combination answer of yes and no. Make sure your motivation fits with it. Please, if you make a point, always give an example. Otherwise, your answer is too ge generic. So if you said yes, you could have said Macbeth is open for the witch's suggestions. They use half-truths to convince him of the future. They mislead him with their predictions. They take advantage of his secret ambition to become king. They only use Macbeth to create chaos in the natural order. Or no, Macbeth is open for the witch's predictions. He believed what the witches told him. He had the ambition of becoming king. Lady Macbeth persuaded him to kill Duncan and become king. Macbeth was open to evil and the witches only took advantage of that. That's the end of our lesson on Macbeth Act 1, the revision. I sincerely hope that all of you enjoyed it as much as I did. Have a wonderful afternoon. Make wise choices. Goodbye.